Charm Podcast, a show where we bring you actionable tips and strategy on how to connect better socially, boost your emotional intelligence, and navigate social behavior. I'm Johnny. And I'm AJ. Welcome back to our month on Mastering Connection. This month, we've packed it with science and techniques to foster stronger connections, set boundaries, and prevent misunderstandings. And last week, we had Laura Heck of the Gottman Institute with us who talked about the four horsemen of terrible behavior in a relationship and also gave us the antidote to those behaviors. Today's episode is actually a bonus episode that it's been a while in the making. We've been very excited to finally get our guest on this show who has a hit show on Netflix, The Kindness Diaries. And as well as that, he has an amazing story to tell about his transformation personally. So we're going to dig into that to start things off. Hello and welcome Leon to the show. Hello. Thanks for having me. So before we get into the travels, the show, we'd love to hear a little bit about your personal journey and your discovery around generosity. Sure. So um, I used to be a broker in the city of London. And on the outside, I had pretty much everything you would want. Um, But on the inside, I was profoundly broken. I was very depressed, very disconnected, very alone. Um, And no one really knew. Uh, because I was wearing a mask and the mask told everyone that I was fine but uh, I was not fine Um, and I I didn't know how to kind of get out of this depression let's put it that way Um, because on the outside I was living the dream many people would love to live that life um, but uh, it was really a nightmare Um, well I would think that would have a, a it would have an impact on your work so how were you able to at least put up this facade for so long of maintaining a uh, good work ethic, getting to work and, and, and making things happen in that world when inside uh, you're certainly beat up, dragging, uh, feeling, uh, not, not wanting to go in and put yourself out there? That's a great question. No one's ever asked me that one. <laughs> um, sometimes you have to do what you have to do. So you have to put on that face, you have to put on that mask, you have to keep going to work, you have to just keep going. Um, And for me, one of the worst days of the week was Sunday evening. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure many people can relate to that, right? Yeah. Um, Because Sunday evening, I knew that, you know, Monday was coming and I'd have to spend five days faking it. Um, And... I became a professional uh, faker Mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know, I, I knew how to make people believe things that weren't going on inside me you know so um i just kept i just kept on going because i had no choice did you ever feel that you were an imposter going there that way 100 percent. yeah i mean you know i remember walking to work every day and being like this is another night another nightmare day but again on the outside it all looked beautiful and it it was like the internal struggle that I, i was hiding from people and with that career journey, uh, when did you start to notice and feel yourself that, hey, you know, I'm not on the right track here? Did you have these goals in mind? And then once you reached those goals career wise, you sort of realized that you were empty on the inside or was it throughout that process? Um, before I started being a broker, in the last semester of college, I started to realize what on earth am I about to do? Because it was a family based business wow. uh, and I yeah. knew that I didn't want to do it. But I just felt that I had to do it. So I did. And it lasted a few years and it it wasn't it wasn't pleasant. What I found interesting in your journey is rather than trying to fix yourself to be able to do that job, you decided to opt out. And I'm sure there's a lot of people who feel that they themselves are the, the, the square peg trying to be put into a round hole and trying to chip away to make that work when in actuality it's certainly not you had found it that it was not in your dna it was not something that you wanted to pursue or figure out yeah and i think many people can relate to that and the Mm -hmm. the thing that i had that really helped me in some like bizarre way was the pain became too much Mm -hmm. and i had to make a decision am i going to live my life in this pain or am I gonna jump off a uh, high dive board and see what happens? And that's where it pushed me. I was pushed off the high dive by the pain. And if I didn't suffer and I wasn't in emotional pain, I would still be there. 
So sometimes pain is good because it inspires you to make some changes. Yeah, and meaningful things in our life typically involve pain because mm. there's change involved. I want to know how you viewed kindness and generosity when you're in this part of your career. Because when you think of broker, you think of London, you think of very successful. Kindness, generosity don't often come to mind. So I was in a, an environment uh, as a broker uh, in the city where, as you just said, kindness is not really you know, a currency that is used. It's all about money. It's all about how successful you can be. Um, and that's not how I wanted to live. Um, and was I kind then? Probably not. I wasn't because that wasn't kind of like what we were taught to be. When you make money, it's not about kindness. It's about how much money you can make. Who can you step on? All this kind of stuff. And that was slowly destroying me inside because I want to be able to like connect with people. I want to like do something um, that, you know, enables me to go on an adventure, but also enables me to help. Um, and as a broker, my experience was that I couldn't do that. So that was kind of just another like step on the road to changing my career. It's not really my career, it's changing my life. Right. Yeah. So what was that first step for you in, in this life change? So I, I saw the movie, The Motorcycle Diaries. <laughs> we were going to ask. Okay, is yeah. Is that really <laughs> the inspiration here? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So I, I, I saw the movie, mm -hmm. The Motorcycle Diaries, which is a romanticized version of Che Guevara mm -hmm. traveling around South America relying on kindness. And I don't know if you've ever like watched a movie where you felt like the director has basically done this movie for you. So I was transfixed for two hours, feeling this magical adventure where again, the romanticized version of Che tells his father, I don't want to be a doctor. I'm going to travel around South America on kindness. And his father kind of is like, what are you doing? Don't do that, stay here. And he's like, no. So he goes out into the world, has an amazing adventure and touches people's lives in a beautiful way. <laughs> and I was like, okay, lovely. There's another way to live. I don't have to live behind this desk anymore. Not that there's anything wrong with living behind a desk, but it's just not for me. Um, and that was really the kind of the tipping point because I'd been slowly getting to the point where I was like, you know, what am I doing? I don't want to sit in this office anymore. Uh, but that was the point where it's like, it's done. I find it a bit amusing that the, the, the piece to that is this romanticized story of Che Guevara. Because certainly when I think of Che Guevara, I don't think about the kindness of and, and how he's interacted with people. Uh, it's very true. And some people, they're like, <laughs> Do you know that Che Guevara was a butcher or whatever they say? And I'm like, yes, I do. But this was a movie that was romanticized <clears> in his <throat> early life before he went to the dark side. Right. So mm -hmm. Now, obviously, to make a decision like this, I'm assuming family, friends are wondering what is going on with you, right? When externally everyone sees you as having the trappings of success and, and living the life that they could only dream of, and then you decide move away from all of that, go in a totally different direction. How did you handle that pushback and, and those thoughts? Well, look, they thought I was a nut job, okay? Which I understand completely because I have everything on a plate and I decide to give it up and go out into the world and connect with people. I get it. Uh, but what they didn't know was what was going on inside me. And when I give my speeches, I, I, I tell people, if you don't listen to anything I say, listen to this. And that is share your pain. Because when you share your pain, your true self comes out. And you don't hold it in, you don't hide behind it, which is what I was doing and many people do for, 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 for most of their lives, to be honest with you. Um, so I think they thought I was a nut job, but I knew that even though I may be a nut job, I also needed to leave because I needed to connect with humanity. And if I didn't do that, and I didn't share my pain, I wouldn't make it. It's literally that simple. And what made you decide to go so far away from home to find humanity? <laughs> Most of us spend our lives in our comfort zones. Yeah? yeah. And sometimes you have to get out of your comfort zone in order to uh, truly grow. So I knew that if I stayed at home, I would stay in my comfort zone. So I forced myself to leave my home so that I would leave my comfort zone and I would have no choice but to fix myself. And with a decision like that, I'm sure there's been moments of 
questioning, did I make the right decision, right? We were gonna talk a little bit about dealing with rejection, obviously relying on people's kindness and generosity. Let's be honest, a lot of strangers, even in the show, look at you, raised eyebrows, what does this guy want? So handling that regret in the decision-making process as things aren't going necessarily as planned, you know, how did you deal with that battle and struggle? Look, I didn't just leave my job and all of a sudden have a Netflix show. Right. Yeah, it took like over a decade of of, of 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 keeping on going, of like never giving up, of of wanting to kind of find my passion, and and then it kind of when it when I found my passion, it wasn't enough just to do it for myself. I had to like do it for others as well. Like I used to travel alone. I didn't have cameras with me, and then one day I realized to myself, I was like, you need to share this with people. You need to, you know, I, I've, I've met many, many wise souls. I've met, read many beautiful books that have helped me. So I was like, I want other people to get some benefit from what I'm doing. Um, and yeah, but there were many moments where I wanted to give up. Many. Like the famous uh, English politician, Winston Churchill. Mm -hmm. He has a famous quote, one of many. And he says, never, never, never give up. And when I'm on the floor... I remember that. Uh, and I tell people, because I get many, many emails and many messages uh, from people who are, you know, suffering. And I tell them it's okay to be on the floor as long as you know that in a day, in a three days, in a week, you're gonna get up. Stay on the floor for as long as you need, but know that you're gonna get up. Now, relying on other people's kindness and generosity, absolute strangers with cultural differences, locations you've never been, language barriers, one, how did it feel the first time having completely given up all of this to deal with that, putting yourself out there, and then two, following up with all of the rejection that comes along the way? And the show, I think, does a great job encapsulating those moments where people are like, hell no, like, <laughs> get away from me, I'm good. Yeah, so when I first started, people would say to me, you can't do it. It's impossible. I actually hitchhiked from Times Square to the Hollywood sign, one of the first things I did. And people were like, it's impossible. And I was like, in the back of my head, I was like, maybe they're right. But I kept on going. And what I realized is it's not impossible. Because the way you connect with another human being is you bypass your mind and you go to your heart. And when you, go through, you come from your heart, you connect with their heart. And when two hearts connect, not necessarily in a romantic setting, but just generally, magic happens. So I knew that ultimately I would find, as I kept on going, I knew that I would ultimately find people that came from their hearts, I would come from my heart and magic would happen. So at the beginning it was like, oh my God, this is impossible. And now it's like, I can do it, you know? Um, the rejection piece is not easy. It's, it's not easy. No one forced me to circumnavigate the world on the motorbike. No one forced me to go around and rely on kindness. But there were moments when people are rejecting me. And I am saying to myself, and sometimes to others, I'm like, what the hell? I'm, you know, this is, this is terrible. I, can't, I don't want to do this anymore. And they're like, because sometimes the crew will say to me, Liam, whose idea was this? I'm like, mine. <laughs> they're like, okay. So I'm like, all right, you're right. You know? So again, as a kid, I used to like, as many of us have this, this issue, I hated rejection, even as an adult. So again, I put myself in a situation where I would have to be rejected day in, day out. So I became okay with rejection. I don't like it, but I became okay with it. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. You have your internal biology that's always gonna create these feelings and emotions, fight or flight, this is scary, I shouldn't be doing this. That doesn't go away, but you understand the payoff on the other side. Obviously having a crew follow you around adds a layer <laughs> of pressure, but let's explore that a little bit in the beginning when it was just you, there were no cameras and rejection truly meant like you're hopeless in that moment, like in that evening, where am I sleeping? Where am I getting a square meal? So how did you deal with that internal battle when you didn't have the producer looking at you going, hey, this was your idea? Yeah. Um, I knew that there was gonna be a payoff as you just mentioned, and the payoff was gonna be magnificent. And that at the end of the day, after putting myself through all these struggles, I was gonna become better. Again, Winston Churchill has a quote that says, when you find yourself walking through hell, keep walking. Um, and what he meant by that, I think, was that when you suffer, when you're in pain, 
find your way through that pain and at the end of that tunnel something magnificent will happen so I kept on going and I knew that I didn't want to go back to my office job so if someone was going to reject me I knew that if I gave up I'd have to go back so I wasn't going to give up I was just going to keep going and in your mind did you envision this turning into a show and a movement or was this more of a personal journey that it started off as a personal journey um but i'd always been a little bit eccentric so you know if it became a show and something beautiful happened from it then then great and that's basically what happened so that's good yeah Absolutely. And we know that when it comes to pitching a show, there's a lot of rejection involved as well with that idea. So I'm assuming this journey for you strengthened your rejection muscles going into the pitch meetings now knowing, hey, they may think this is a crazy idea as well. Yeah. And, and also in Hollywood, if you don't have a name um, and you go into a pitch meeting, there's a very good chance that even if it's a good idea, someone's going to you know, be a little bit nefarious and give it to some celebrity or someone. And that's just part of life in this town. Sure. Uh, and that happened. <clears throat> and it doesn't just happen to me, it happens to many people. So that was, that was difficult as well. Now, the show is The Kindness Diaries. For those in our audience who maybe haven't encountered it on Netflix yet, can you give us your pitch to the audience of what The Kindness Diaries is to you? Do you know what? I, I'm a really bad pitcher, but <laughs> I'll try. So uh, basically there were two seasons. Uh, one season is on Amazon Prime and the second season is on Netflix. Um, first season, I took a vintage yellow motorbike with a sidecar, uh, called it Kindness One, and drove it from Los Angeles all the way around Earth back to Los Angeles. I had no money, no food, no gas, no place to stay. All I had was relying on people like you and people like your listeners. And there was a little bit of a twist. And the twist was that unsuspecting Good Samaritans received a life-changing gift. So if you were super duper looper kind to me and we had a bond and a connection and there was something that I felt that maybe I could help, I would. Uh, and then there was season two, uh, which is currently on Netflix. And I drove a 50 year old VW Beetle, <laughs> yellow, convertible <clears throat> from Alaska in the middle of winter to the bottom of Argentina. Uh, again, same concept, and there's no heating in the car, and it's it's madness. I remember arriving in Alaska, and I was like, "You finally lost your mind." <laughs> this, but there's no point. There's no at that point you can't change your plans. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't be like, "Oh, sorry, crew, we're going home." Sorry, Netflix, we're not going to do it. You have to do it. You have to get to Argentina, um, and. It's just, it, but it's such a beautiful experience. It's very challenging, but it's a very beautiful experience. You get to truly connect with people. And we live in a world where most people aren't connecting. They think they are. They're on Twitter, they're on Instagram, they're on Facebook. But the truest form of connection is from one human being to another, from one heart to another. Um, and then there's the connection with nature. It's, it changes everything. For me personally, it changed everything. The, that, the whole kindness diary has just shifted so much. Now, the vehicle, obviously, Motorcycle Diaries understand that, but the vehicle choice in both seasons being yellow, is there a significance to the color? Yeah, so as a kid, I love, I don't know if you've watched the movie Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I, maybe Johnny. Johnny's the Johnny? movie buff. That I'm name is very familiar. Okay, so Chitty Chitty Bang Bang is an old movie about a car that flies. Yeah? Okay. And I used to watch that as a kid. So the car was a character. Um, and I wanted the bike to be a character. Like people will come up to me in the street and they will literally say, aren't you the captain of Kindness One? I'm like, yes, I'm the captain of Kindness One. And now they will come up to me and say, aren't, aren't you the captain of Kindness Two? I'm like, yes, I'm the captain of Kindness Two. So I wanted to make it a character. Um, and sometimes people say to me, why didn't you just use a new bike? Why didn't you just use a new car? Why do you like torturing yourself? And I said, <laughs> well, if I use a new bike, you guys wouldn't be that interested in watching it because the bike would never break. If I used a new car, the same thing. Um, so I wanted the viewer to get an experience of this crazy Englishman driving a 50 year old car that kept, that keeps on breaking down because it's part of the show. It's part of the charm of the show, let's say. Uh, and it makes it harder because like I said, if I had a new car, it would be easy. 
Well, yeah, I remember going through Alaska, the windshield wipers had frozen onto the windshield. You can barely see getting caught in snow. Of course, if you have all wheel drive, a brand new car, full heating, people are like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. But the journey is definitely a lot more difficult with the vehicles you chose. Yeah, something that stuck out one of your, it was a talk that I had seen it where you mentioned the love-hate relationship that you had with your vehicles. <laughs> Yeah. I do definitely have a love-hate relationship with them. I don't know if you saw the episode when it was snowing in the car. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, okay, it's snowing in the car. Good. I felt your sense of relief when I believe you arrived in Utah and were able to finally like strip down and not have to rely on all the layers just yeah. to keep going. Absolutely. Something I wanted to, to go back to, you mentioned this first trip from New York, hitchhiking from New York to, to the Hollywood sign. And we were talking about, about the best way to connect with somebody is being there, being there for them. And we can't find those things online. And I think it's the same with self-discovery. How are you going to be able to find out who you really are and how you truly think and how you truly deal with things around you if, if you don't take yourself out of uh, all the influence and the comfort that we find ourselves in in daily life? And during that trip, uh, did you was this the first time that you had detached yourself from that influence and 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 from your comfort zone for the first time? No, um, I had actually done a little bit of traveling before by myself. Okay. I, I was still working in the office, but I had taken some time off, um, and I'd went to Nepal by myself. I'd went to Peru by myself, and I'd had like experiences of living completely alone. Let's say. Mm -hmm. um, but that was the first time that I truly had done it on kindness, 100%. Right. I'd, I'd done backpacking, so I had a little bit of money, but this that journey across America is one of the first times I did it uh, with no money. So on those other trips, did you did you have a sense of satisfaction and, and fulfillment to where you knew that you needed to sort of get back to something to of that experience too. One one hundred percent. I would go on these journeys and I would come back and I would feel free. But then I would fall apart again. Because, you know, it's like you leave you leave the matrix and then you come back to the matrix and the matrix just just, you know, gobbles you up. Mm -hmm. Now obviously approaching complete strangers with basic human needs I know a lot of us, even here in LA, we have a homeless problem. We look at people who approach us on the street, we avoid them. What was it like that first time to approach someone in complete need, uh, having no money, no means, and has your approach changed over the years in the way that you approach people? Because I know on the show, you started with, do you want to hear a story? And typically, you know, people will look at you a little funny, like, what do you mean, do I want to hear a story? I don't know you at all. So how is that approach, how did the approach start and, and how has it changed over time? Obviously you've been, become more seasoned now. Yeah, so um, when the conquistadors arrived in the Americas, many of them burnt their ships. And they burnt their ships so they had no choice but to keep moving, yeah? Um, and sometimes in life you have to burn your ships. And that's what I did uh, when I left my career. I burnt my ship. So I had no choice but to keep on moving. So when it came to like talking to people on the streets, I had no choice. If I didn't talk to them and get them to help me, I was screwed. So that's one, that's how it first started. I didn't have any like tricks up my sleeve. I just burnt my ships. And as time went on, I started to, you know, learn some, I don't want really to call them tricks, but I, to learn some strategies. Um, one of the main strategies that I use is to connect with someone based on a mutual connection. So if I come up to you, for example, um, and I say to you, let's say at a party or wherever, do you like soccer? Okay, and you say, yes, it's done. I love soccer. So immediately I have a connection with you and we'll start talking about soccer. And if you say to me, no, you don't like soccer, I'll keep going until there's something that we can connect with. And some people will say, well, you know, I, I don't have something that I can connect, connect with this chap, but the truth is you always do. So maybe you can say, do you have a kid? Like, yes, I have a kid too. Do you love your kid? Yes, oh, I love my kid, done, end. So that's one of the most important things. Another thing that I do is, I mentioned this earlier, is I come from the heart. 
I try and bypass the mind and speak to people from my heart, um, which is which is always a safe bet of how to connect. Um, another thing I do is my personal distance. I will never come up to someone really close. I will stay away. I will stay further away than normal, yeah, to make them feel completely safe. If they say no, I will thank them profusely. I'll say, no worries, don't worry, thank you very much, and I will move on. Um, so I think those are the main things that I do. I noticed another uh, approach that you had is sort of opening up your hands, showing your palms, yeah, yeah. And, and having very open body language. And it, there's like a lack of tension in your body. You're very relaxed as you approach people so they can see your hands. You don't have anything in your pockets that could scare them. Obviously, there's a, a threat that's posed by you yeah. coming up to a complete stranger. Yeah. And it seems like in your body language, speaking from the heart, you're also open and allowing the other person to see, okay, there's really no funny business going on here. 100%. I mean, you have to understand that when you do go up to a stranger, the immediate reaction, I do the same thing. It's like, of course, what does this guy, what does this guy want? Or what does this woman want? But if you can diffuse that fear, then you can get to the heart. Another thing I liked of how you propose the question, do you like soccer or whatever this might be? We certainly know with our classrooms, uh, in dealing with people on the street, if you go up to them and go, excuse me, sir, do you have a second? They're always going to tell you, well, no, I don't have a second. They're going to keep walking. However, but if you said, excuse me, do you like soccer? I, I Excuse me, what? And then it's, it's a captured audience. Exactly. We just finished filming something uh, about travel. And I would go up to people and I would say, do you like travel? <laughs> they were, basically, every single person said yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you'd go in from there. Um, so, and another interesting thing, to, now we're talking about how to connect with people. A couple, uh, about like last week, I was doing this show and I was very tired. So I sat down and I started asking people whether they liked travel. No one would even talk to me because the energy I was giving off sure. was of like, you know, who is this guy? He's sitting down, he doesn't really care. He's, he's clearly not present. So I was like, okay, this is interesting. So I stood up again and then everything worked. Now, are there any signals that you pick up on in people that might be open to receive your heart message? Eye contact, body language, how are you picking the people you approach? So I pick the people based on a feeling, based on whether I feel they are connected to their hearts. Most of the time I'm correct, sometimes I'm not. Um, if I'm walking down the street and I see someone who's angry, I will leave them alone. If I look, um, see someone who's clearly in a rush, I'll leave them alone. Um, if I'm like, let's say on a, you know, on a road that doesn't have that many people and it's just a, a, a single woman, I'll think twice about going up to them. But those are, those are the, the main ways that I do it. Really, it's a feeling. When I dip into my heart and the vibration that your heart gives off, that's how I do it best. When I'm in my mind, I fail more often than not. Right. When I'm in my heart, I succeed pretty much 100% of the time. Now, how has the camera changed the equation? Obviously, and even as we'll delve into season two, having to get the crew down to Costa Rica, you know, you needed Southwest to comp you and the crew. I'm assuming you're not now traveling alone. There's cameras, there's audio. Has that changed the way people react to you and even coming from the heart in the yeah. questioning? Um, it hasn't changed the way that I come from my heart, but it has in some way made it easier. Yeah. Um, I go up to people without the cameras though. So I'll go up to them. I'll say, Hey, you know, I'm doing this, blah, blah, blah. Here's my bike. And this is the story. And they're like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And then I say, would you be willing for us to film you? And they say, sure. Then I have to do it again for the cameras. Yeah. Right. And from the point when the moment of introduction has ended, then it's, it's all, you know, it's all genuine. Um, which well, genuine anyway, mm -hmm. but I have to repeat it. Right. Because I can't just come up to you with a camera in your face. You're going to be like, what are you doing? Who are you? <laughs> so I have to do it gently. Um, there are times when the camera helps and there are times when the camera is not a help. 
there are there are places where cameras are looked at with a lot of um, skepticism. Skepticism, and there are times when cameras put you in a lot of danger. Threatening, yeah. yeah. So you have to be careful. You have to kind of like feel the situation. When should the cam? Is it safe to put the camera out? Like for example, I'm not sure if you saw the Colombian episode. Yeah. Episode eight. But of season two, basically, we, we made a decision. We were, had to drive about 400 miles through some pretty terrible territory where people had been executed, people had been uh, kidnapped, and we made a decision not to leave the car. So we didn't film. We filmed in the car and from the chase vehicle, but we never left it because that was a moment where getting out and using the camera would have caused serious problems. Right. So... Has there been times during the filming where perhaps the the crew is telling you, "Hey, I don't, I don't think we should be doing this right now," or where you were telling the to the crew, like where there was a difference of opinion of of safety or intuition, right? Because you're obviously coming at it from your heart, so exactly. you're you're looking at the the person and and thinking about things far differently than the camera crew thinking about the shot yeah. and all that yeah. other stuff. Um, there specifically Columbia. The crew, the production manager, was the man who was in charge of not filming. He would say to me, look, this is really dangerous. We can't do this. And I'd be like, I trusted him. I was like, okay, no worries. But every day on the on the shoot, it's pretty much me. And I, I, I'm aware, you see, it's not just about coming from your heart. It's about intuition. Maybe that's the same thing. I don't know. But you have to be intuitive. Is this, this is, we shouldn't do this or we should do this and your intuition tells you well i think you know part of that is strengthening that muscle for you right yes. so if i think if we were to look at your career as a broker you were battling your intuition and saying it's not right to keep on track to keep your family friends all and obviously the family business moving since then since leaving i think your intuition is strengthened obviously approaching all these people picking up on these subtle signals that arguably your intuition might even be stronger than the film crew's intuition based on the reactions that you've seen time and time again from approaching people it is it is 100 percent stronger in the sense that i have experienced so much whilst traveling i know look sometimes i make mistakes and uh, but sometimes you can't afford to make mistakes. But I know, I know, okay, this is the wrong road to walk down, we're not going there. This is the right one, we're going there. There was a story actually when I was um, in India in season one. Uh, we filmed it, but it didn't end up in the show. Uh, I, was in, I was in India, I was in Delhi. I was in one of the, the markets, the Paraganj market. I started chatting with this guy who was a rickshaw driver. I ended up uh, going back to his house and I, I spent some time in some of the poorest parts of India. We were playing cricket and I actually, I, I, I said to myself, I trusted this guy, even though I didn't know him, I trusted him. I had known him for half an hour, but I felt he would protect us. Um, and we ended up going to play cricket in, in the slums um, and I made a big mistake. On camera, in front of like 30 or 40 people, I was playing cricket, I turned to the camera and I said, um, playing cricket in an Indian slum, priceless. And some guy looked at me who had lived in the slum, said, how dare you call my home a slum? And he was being belligerent. And had the guy who I'd met in the uh, market not been there, it could have been a very serious problem. But the guy from the market said to him, look, leave him alone, he's with me. So I made a mistake, but I didn't make a mistake because I went with the guy who I felt would say would protect us right now obviously spanning the globe different cultures you know we live in the western world obviously your career started in the, and your life started in the western world what have you noticed the difference in the way people respond to you your approach and is it as cultural as people think or is kindness generosity universal if you approach someone and connect with someone from your heart doesn't matter their color doesn't matter their religion doesn't matter how much money they have um, if there's a heart connection it doesn't matter where you where you live um, so it was definitely a very enlightening moment for me moments to know because sometimes we live in a world where you turn on the news and they say oh you know if you're from this part of the world you're bad and then you go to that part of the world and you realize oh they're not bad at all they're actually exactly like me now the the payoff on the end right as we talked about earlier the show is unsuspecting kindness 
gets rewarded. So you have a great connection with someone. They help you, give you food, shelter, and then at the end of the show, you give them something that's life-changing. What's been your favorite life-changing moment during both seasons of really being able to give someone an amazing gift? I know that the stories have varied from rent to travel to opportunities that these people never imagined. Was there one in your mind that really stands out? Yeah, definitely. I was in Pittsburgh. And uh, I was going up to people and asking if I could stay with them. And they were saying no, which is fine. Um, then I, saw, I went up to this one chap and I said, can I stay in your house tonight? After talking to him for a little bit. And he goes, look, I'm really sorry, but I'm homeless. He didn't look homeless, but he clearly was. And I was about to walk off. I felt some shame. You know, I just asked a homeless man to stay in his house. And he turns around and he says, well, you know what? If you want, you can stay with me tonight. I'll feed you, I'll protect you, and I'll give you some clothes. Every part of my being was like, Leon, you're not sleeping on the streets of Pittsburgh. But there was that one little counterintuitive voice that said, Leon, my good friend, you are staying on the streets of Pittsburgh tonight. And that's exactly what happened. And his name was Tony. And he taught me a profound lesson. He taught me that true wealth is not in our wallets, but it's in our hearts. And if a, if a homeless man with nothing can be kind, then why can't I? If a homeless man with nothing can be kind, then why can't you? Uh, and he taught me another lesson, and that is that kindness is free. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how little money you have. Kindness is free. And sleeping on the streets of Pittsburgh for that one night changed everything for me because it made me realize that, uh, again, like with the motorcycle diaries, there's another way to live. And if he can be kind, then I have no excuses. The next morning, I took him on Kindness One in the sidecar, and I... I put him up in an apartment and I sent him back to school. He always wanted to uh, be a chef. So, and he always says to me, you changed my life. And I always say the same thing, Tony, you changed my life. And that's the truth, you know? Yeah, I mean, the lessons that come out of it, I remember you in Tijuana and the family opening their home. And the first thing the family says is they apologize to you. You know, we're so poor, our house is in poor shape, really sorry for you to have to experience this. Obviously the cameras are there. And then the moment you're sitting on the couch thinking about if the roles were reversed, someone was on your doorstep in London knocking on, on your door, would you open your house to them? And you know, that moment for me sitting next to Amy watching the show, just thinking like, you know, I don't know that we could do it either. You know, we often look at our own safety, our own personal well-being, and our homes is very sacred. And here, are all these people who have, you know, less than you can imagine are willing to open their door, give you a tamale, give you a couch to sleep on. I'm assuming the lessons along the way have changed you, your view now in opening up your home and, and of kindness and generosity. How has it shifted and, and what's been the biggest lesson there? So I was in Santa Monica about a year ago and uh, there was a guy that was this is the first time I've ever shared this publicly there was a guy that was walking the, the that tra the trail mm -hmm. of, I can't remember the name of it um, the, Pac uh, the Pacific Coast Trail okay. and he was ending up in LA and he was about to sleep on the beach and I felt connected to him you know and I was like okay and I said well look do you want to come and stay in my house he's like yeah sure so he ended up staying in my house now, I locked my door, <laughs> my personal door, but whatever, yeah. you know, I, I trusted him. I felt that it was, I guess I didn't trust him enough to not lock my door. But um, if you feel connected to someone, it doesn't take long to, to trust them. But you can't connect from the mind. You have to connect from somewhere, somewhere else. You have to connect from your heart. Um, so yeah, that, that, that happened and I would do it again. Uh, but it, if I felt even the slightest bit unsafe, I wouldn't do it. So, so you have opened your door. Yes, I have. Uh, one of the things that we had talked about this week is, is was boundary setting. And in order to feel safe, you, you have to put some boundaries together that, that will protect you and that at least will, that you will feel will keep you out of harm's way. Now, upon opening your door and having these events, uh, has your boundaries changed or is there certain things that you stick to in order to enable yourself to open your doors to other people? My boundary is simple. If I don't feel safe, you're not coming into my house. If I don't feel safe, 
you're you're not going to be part of my life. So that's it. That's my boundary. Um, and I am aware intuitively of the moment of safety and non-safety. So that's that's really how I do it. Same with in the show. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put myself in a situation, even with a camera crew, where I'm not I'm not safe. It's just not going to happen. In terms it, of even though in saying that, I did drive 400 miles in a place where people were being executed. So that's not really 100% true. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we saw you reroute your travels so you didn't have to go through yeah. uh, essentially the southern part of Mexico with all those warnings, travel advisories. Um, but you did put yourself in, in harm's way. Yes. You have tested that intuition. You know, the flip side of all of this obviously is other people and their safety and feeling okay with letting you into their life. Yes. Is there anything you do in your pitch to show them the boundaries that you have to allow them to feel comfortable? I just, I do my best to make them feel like A, clearly it's your choice. You know, if you say no, there's no problem whatsoever. I will leave in a jiffy. Um, and it's just like coming from a, 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 a connecting to my humanity. If I connect to my humanity, you will connect to your humanity and then you will feel safe. Um, and again, you know, with the show, it's a bit easier because there's a camera crew. So they're in their, in their minds, they're like, OK, this guy's not a nut job because he's got a camera crew. He's not going to do anything to me because then, you know, the camera crew will see or whatever. So it becomes harder when you don't have a, a, a camera crew. But it's not impossible. I mean, I've traveled the world and stayed in crazy places with no camera crew whatsoever. I was in Uzbekistan, ended up uh, completely lost, went to this little village, started talking to this guy who was a melon seller. And no cameras. It was just me and a friend, a little tiny little camera. Um, and he ended up letting us sleep in his barn. And we ate dinner with him and his family. There was nothing, there was no f film crew. It was just me, him, and my friend and, and the village. That was it. I think what's remarkable about the show for me is, and we talk a lot about this on the show, is we connect through stories. Mm. And a big part of the show is being able to hear your host stories and understanding what they're struggling with and where they come from. And what's always been remarkable to me is just how vulnerable these complete strangers will get with you. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with your ability to listen and really uh, emote with them. You know, what have you learned over obviously both journeys now um, around being more present, being there for someone else's story? I feel like so many of us these days just want to blurt out our story and yeah. want everyone to know our story. But a big part of the show is just sitting back and listening to your host stories. Exactly. So one of the people sometimes say to me, what did you learn? from your journeys? What is the most important thing you learned? And the most important thing I learned was that we all just want to be seen. We want, and by that I mean we want to be loved, we want to be heard. And that's what I do for them. I just sit there and I see them. And they open up. Um, and I listen. And I empathize. Um, and I, and as many of us have, have suffered a lot of emotional pain. And I can empathize with you. Um, and when someone feels like you see them, they will just come out of their shell. And that's what we do. That's what I do. And then I share my pain too. Um, have you seen episode eight with the dog? Yeah. Okay. All right. So you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> well, clarify that for the audience. Okay, that, right, okay. That's an interesting one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I end up in Ecuador um, and I meet this uh, unbelievable woman who like is saving dogs. She has like 30 dogs in her house and she has such a beautiful heart. And she tells me the story of why she's saving dogs. Cause as a kid, her parents abandoned her and she put all her love that she didn't get from her parents into dogs cause she couldn't have kids. And, and, and I had a dog called Winston. Winston Churchill, who, you know, really meant a lot to me. And we bonded over that and we were both crying and it was just, it was a beautiful moment. If you have a dog, watch it. <laughs> Cause you may start crying, but you'll feel grateful at the end. So let's dig a little deeper into kindness itself, right? We've obviously we understand 
the momentum it's built for you on these journeys, but what does kindness actually mean to you? And for those of us who are struggling to be kind, what advice do you have? So kindness to me is very simple. It's helping someone feel less alone. That's it. It's not rocket science. Every person on this planet has felt alone. And I would hope that the vast majority of us have at least at one stage in our lives had someone whose kindness has helped us feel less alone. So that's it. All you have to do to be kind is to help another human being feel less alone. Going along those lines, a lot of us feel that our kindness will be taken advantage of Absolutely. and used against us. So yeah. for those in the audience who have struggled to, to feel kind because we've been taken advantage of by someone else and, and thought, hey, I'm just gonna get it thrown back at me. How can we instill, develop kindness for yeah. others? So I understand that because when you're kind, you're vulnerable. When you uh, are vulnerable, you are open to be squashed. Um, sometimes I tell people about the great Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali was a man of faith, a man of love, a man of kindness, a man of strength. Not perfect, no one is. How many of you would mess with Muhammad Ali? <laughs> and my point is, you can be kind and you can be strong. So you can, you can be kind, you can be vulnerable with the right people. You don't have to like go out into the world and be vulnerable with your worst enemy. They're gonna squash you. Go out and be kind to someone that you believe is going to not squash you and start with baby steps. Um, and I think that's, that's the trick. You have to be careful who you're vulnerable with. Because if you're vulnerable with the wrong person, then they may take advantage of you. But if you, if you go out into the world and you're vulnerable, but you have boundaries, then kindness is the greatest strength. So you go out into the world and you're kind, you're open-hearted, but if someone comes into your space and someone does something that is clearly not acceptable, you stand up like Muhammad Ali. Winston Churchill had, has, has been a very controversial figure. Uh, you quoted him twice, you named your dog Winston. Um, do you see him in the same light as Muhammad Ali or was it something uh, different? You, you have to understand with Winston Churchill that A, I'm English. Mm -hmm. So Winston Churchill was lionized for, for the English. And also, yes, he most probably wasn't one of the kindest people in the world, <laughs> but he was the one person that was needed at, at the time to save the world from Nazism. Certainly. So his strength helped all of us, really. Like there were some times in the world, in moments in time where you need that one person. So just like Nelson Mandela, Mandela was the one person that could have helped and saved South Africa in that moment. If he hadn't been Nelson Mandela, then things would have turned out very, very badly. And that's, in my opinion, the same with Winston Churchill. Was he the kindest man? No, but he was the right man at the right time to help Europe uh, defeat the Nazis. That's my opinion. Now, have you developed relationships with all of these hosts? You, you mentioned uh, the guy in Pittsburgh, the gentleman that you've helped out. Obviously, you've done a lot in your kindness for others. What are the relationships that have come out of the show for you? Sure. I mean, look, I don't stay in touch with all, all the people that I meet, but I certainly stay in touch with some of them. Like, for example, Diru, uh, the Indian rickshaw driver. I'm actually going to India tomorrow and I'm going to stay with him. So for a few nights. Um, and Tony, the homeless guy, um, Willie from episode one, the Scottish guy that ended up going back to England for his son's wedding, stay in touch with him. Um, so yeah, some of the people I do stay in touch with, some of them I don't. And do you find that obviously their lives have been touched by you, but what's been the payoff since the show? Because obviously we, we see glimpses of what's happened, but. Yeah, look, basically what we offered them was an opportunity they get to choose whether they really want to take that opportunity. And there are some people that did, and there are some people that didn't. Um, and all the people that I mentioned did. And some of the people that didn't, they will remain anonymous. Right. And having this journey documented, obviously, now friends, family back home, I'm sure are less worried about you, understand <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> How they does that change happen? From, hey, this guy's crazy to, oh, okay. Well, look, they still think I'm a nut job because I am a nut job and <laughs> okay. that's okay. 
You know, sometimes you got to be a nut job to like make magic happen or whatever. Yeah. Um, but they see that it, it, it affects people's lives. Um, and there are moments in the journeys where I want to give up. And I think to myself, I've pushed myself too far. But I always have this voice in my head that says, well, you know, keep going because there are going to be people that are going to watch your show. There are going to be people that are going to listen to podcasts and hopefully be inspired to change their lives. So I keep going. And the book, Go Be Kind. What is the goal with this book for go, you? Go Be Kind. So people would come up to me and they'd say, I can't quit my job and travel around the world and be kind <laughs> like you. And I'm like, okay, maybe you can't, but that's not the point of kindness. The point of kindness is how you show up moment to moment. You don't have to quit your job. You don't have to get a yellow car. You don't have to become a nut job. But what you have to do is show up moment to moment. So what I did was I created a book where you get to go on your own kindness diaries adventure. There's 28 and a half adventures guaranteed to make you happier. Okay, get your money back if you don't become happier, it's true. Um, and you get to go out into the world and have your own adventure. You get to go out into the world and connect with people. You get to go out into the world and do all the things that we've talked about in this podcast, you get the chance to do them. You get the chance to change someone's life. You get the chance to make someone feel less alone. You get the chance to go out and love people the same way you love your dog. All the things that I did in the kindness diaries, you can now do. So can you share one of those adventures with our audience? We love to end every episode with a challenge. Sure. So one of the adventures is called Winnie Love, the Winnie Love Challenge. My dog, Winston Churchill. Mm -hmm. um, I realized that I was loving Winston in, with so much patience and kindness and love that what would happen if I went out into the world and did the same thing for you? If I treated you with the same love that I treated Winston? Um, so I did the seven day Winnie Love Challenge. And I did that. I treated you with the same love. And you guys get to go out, you two. Actually, in fact, I'm challenging you to go out today and treat people with Winnie Love. And also the people that are listening to the, to the podcast to go out into the world and spend one day treating people with the same love that you treat your dog. It will change everything. I love that challenge. And I think for us on the show here, we've been talking about giving value, being kind for over a decade now. And a lot of people come to us and say, well, that's great. You guys have the means to be kind and generous. And our retort is always, we could be kind with our thoughts. We could be kind with our attention. We could be generous with our patience. There, there are things that you could do to be kind that do not involve having means, having money to be kind. And I think that's really the greatest lesson from the show that I've taken away. And I'm really excited to check out the book. And, and, and the thing that I've, I've learned is that the people with the least are the kindest. It's quite extraordinary. So if there are people out there that say, oh, because I don't have the means or, or because I don't have a show or because I don't have a podcast, remember that all you have to do to be kind is to help someone feel less alone. Whether they're working at Starbucks, whether they're your train conductor, whether they're the, the person who's just cut you off on the freeway, all you have to do is make them feel less alone. You don't need a single penny to do that. Thank you so much for being kind with your time. Excited to hear about your trip to India. Is there a cricket planned? Oh, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me.